When we see a well-composed image, we tend to react to it on a typically guttural, intuitive aesthetic level. But more often than not, there's a lot more than meets the eye going into the composition of that image. And so I'd like to introduce you to the elements and principles of design. These are the tricks of the trade that artists of all kinds use when trying to create an aesthetically pleasing image. Now I will say, there are many different variations of these lists of elements and principles. What I've tried to do is compile the best amalgam of those lists as I could into something that is what I use as an artist and what I think is generally agreed upon, um, barring those few variations. So here we go. Elements and principles of design. Now elements are essentially the things that make up an image and principles are essentially the effects that those things can create. So we should start with the very basics, the most simple thing you can possibly have, a point. A point is technically not even an element or a principle because it is actually zero-dimensional. It doesn't exist whatsoever. It is merely a mathematical figment of our imagination that helps us locate a thing but it is the only way to start having any elements at all. So we start with a point. A point is zero-dimensional. It has no width, no height, no depth, but it locates some area of, a, of an image. Once you add in a dimension, bring it to one-dimensional, say length, you get a line. Now lines are the first elements of design. And lines are interesting things because they uh, have a lot of characteristics and, and power that you don't often notice right off the bat. Lines are essentially anything that depicts a boundary, anything that implies a separation between one thing and another thing. And similar to a point, they don't typically exist in real life. They're implied. You don't usually see an outline, but you do see where one thing stops and another thing starts. But lines can communicate. For example, horizontal lines tend to give a feeling of stability because they relate to the natural experience of the horizon, the ground, things that we stand on, things that are unshaking, unshaken and unchanging. Vertical lines lend a little bit more dynamic. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here you can have here you have a uh, another image that uses horizontal lines to depict a feeling of stability. Vertical lines add a little bit more of a dynamic feel because of the verticality. Um, now it exceeds our usual experience of uh, experiencing the world in a, a human plane from left to right as we walk about, but now we're actually scanning up and down. And so we start to see movement into the sky. Um, and so we get a little bit more dynamic effect. Diagonal lines take that one step further. All the things that we see diagonal lines in, in uh, na nature are usually things that are moving, things that are receding, things that are protruding, and so we tend to get more of a, a dynamic effect with a diagonal line than with a horizontal or vertical. For example, a train rushing at you. And take it one step further and you could have a curvilinear line. And these are the most dynamic because they sort of tend to take your eye for a ride. Um, you move with it rather than just getting a sense of the movement. Your eye actually sweeps along with it and you, you almost experience movement. These lines might be implied even in the sense of not being a contiguous, continuous, unbroken line. You might just get a sense of the line as in these balls creating a line. Now that's the one-dimensional, but we can bring this into two dimensions, maybe length and width, or height and width. And this is where we get our second element of design, shape. Once you start connecting lines together and you get something that is two-dimensional, you get a shape. And shapes are how you build anything. An artist learns very early on that shapes comprise all objects, and if you can learn basic shapes and how they connect together, you can draw just about anything. For example, 
For example, Mickey can be drawn entirely of circles. And this is true of even the most complex images. If we take something like Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, when you start to really break it down, you start to see squares and rectangles. You start to see triangles and a whole array of shapes are what actually make up this composition. Now, of course, great artists are able to even bring this a step further by including symbolic meaning and, and purpose behind these shapes. For example, the triangles um, referring to the Trinity in this painting, uh, the squares referring to uh, a sort of um, earthly stability and heaven coming to earth, threes and fours being paired. So now we can take it into the third dimension and pop those shapes out into a realm of depth. So now we've got height, width, depth. We've gone from zero dimensions with a point to one dimensions with a line to two dimensions with shapes and now three dimensions with form. And forms are only forms because they give us a sense of depth. They imply three-dimensional objects that we could physically hold. Now obviously they're illusions because I can't hold this paper or this screen uh, any more than you, you could hold it, but it's, uh, it looks as if it could be held. One of the greatest tricks that you learn as an artist is to try and avoid drawing what you know and instead draw what you see. One of the greatest ways to draw a nose is to not draw a nose, but instead to draw the shadows that describe the nose. And so you can see in this portrait here that uh, some internet user has provided. Um, the nose here is very sparse in the way of lines, but entirely defined only by shadow. If you can draw the shadow around an object, you start to get a sense of the form of the object, and that nose starts to pop out a lot more than if you had just drawn the typical triangle nose or, or half-circle nose. You can accomplish this um, depth by just adding a little bit of shading. You can see here the uh, on the top example the difference here is the location of the shadow compared to the square, the rectangle creating it. And you can see the one with the more shadow uh, separation from the from the object is creating a lot more depth. Similarly the one on the bottom is just two identical triangles but the one that has shadow included all of a sudden takes on uh, much more receding depth. You can accomplish this in photography as well. Um, when you use a flash, there are two types of flash you can use. There's what's called the direct flash, in which you're using the flash that's typically mounted on the camera itself that's aimed directly at the object. But this tends to flatten out your subject because all of the light is coming from the same direction that you're viewing it. However, if you use a bounce flash or an alternate light source so that the flash is coming from the side or from some other angle, now you start to create shadows. And where the shadows are, you get a, a distinction of depth. And so here you can see the study trying to play with where, what kind of depth, um, be it very deep or very superficial, can be a, created using just angle of, of uh, lighting and shadow. Now if you're keeping track at home, this gives us our first tip for creating depth using these elements and principles of design. Shadow and shading is a good way to create depth in any image, be it drawn, painted, um, uh, photographed, or any other medium. This brings us to our next element, color. Color is a whole world of its own um, and we could spend lesson upon lesson just on color, but I'll try and give you the briefest overview uh, of all of the comprehensive basics for color theory that I can muster. You have three primary colors. Now it's worth noting that the primary colors are the colors that you can uh, mix together to make any other color in the spectrum. However, there are two sets of primaries because light and pigment behave differently. Light is what's known as additive color mixing because when you mix the light together 
you're actually getting uh, the more light, the more uh, color blends, and you're seeing the light. Uh, th this will make more sense in a second. Essentially, when you have pigment, you're, what you're seeing is not the light, but you're seeing the reflection of what is not absorbed by the object. So with light mixing, with additive mixing, if you were to mix all of the colors together, all of the colors of light together, you would have the most light possible, which would actually result in seeing white. However, an object that is white in front of you with white pigment, what it's doing is it's actually absorbing all of the colors except what you see, and it's bouncing those back to you. So that's called subtractive color mixing. And so if you were to mix all of the pigments together, you're actually going to get black instead of white. What we're dealing with now is subtractive color mixing, um, which is what is more useful to most designers because that's how ink behaves, that's how toner behaves, that's how paint behaves. Unless you're doing theater or lighting design, um, this is what you're probably going to want to pay attention to. So the primary colors for pigment, for uh, subtractive color mixing, are yellow, red, and blue. These are the colors that you can't mix outright, but if you mix them together with each other in various proportions, you can get any other color. If you mix a primary with another primary, you get a secondary color. So red plus yellow gives you orange. Yellow plus blue gives you green. Green, uh, excuse me, blue plus red gives you violet. These secondary colors can, of course, then be mixed together with the primaries next to them to get a third level, a tertiary level, tertiary colors. So yellow plus green equals yellow-green. Green plus blue equals blue-green. By the way, when you're naming these colors, you always name the primary first and then the secondary second. So blue and green. Blue is the primary, green is the secondary. So the color in between becomes blue-green, primary, secondary. Blue plus violet is blue-violet. Red plus violet is red-violet. Red plus orange is red-orange. Orange plus yellow is yellow-orange. This gives you your full color spectrum. These can be divided into two groups warm colors and cool colors. It's a fairly intuitive uh, divide. Warm colors are the colors more associated with heat, with fire. Cool colors are more associated with ice, with cold. Yellow and violet can actually go either way depending on the context. They may be warm in some situations, they may be cool in some situations. Now you can put these colors together and mix them in uh, various ways to further inflect what kind of colors they are. For example, you may have a value scale of any given color where you add white or black to that color to make it lighter or darker. The art terms for these are shades and tints. If you take a color, say red, and add black to it, you get a shade of black, which makes it darker. Shade thinks shadows, it gets darker. And tints, if you're adding white, makes the color lighter. So then you can have a full value scale of all of these colors that we just created. You can also play with saturation by adding white and black, or gray. White plus black is of course gray, and so if you add various degrees of gray to your color, you're going to desaturate it, bring the color closer to gray. And these are called tones in color theory speak. So now you have a whole array of colors that you can create with darker or lighter values or more saturated or less saturated tones. This leads us to another way of creating depth. Because it turns out, if you look out into the distance, things that are less saturated because they have mixed with clouds in between you and that object, for, for example, tend to look farther away. And so this is what people have referred to as, oh, atmospheric perspective. There we go, I thought I had that on the last slide, but here it is for you. Atmospheric perspective is when you get a sense of atmospheric depth because of the saturation of the object, desaturated objects looking farther away. So now let's get back to our color theory lesson here. Once you have your colors, you can then start combining them 
And this is the uh, bring out your interior designer here and start picking out color palettes for your house. Um, these are the typical standard conventional color schemes for artisan designers. Your house would probably look pretty garish and boring this way, but you'll end up with really striking images. So again, if we go all the way back to the most simple uh, variation here, just as a point was the most simple variation of any three-dimensional, two-dimensional, one-dimensional, zero-dimensional object, the zero dimension, so to speak, of color would be called achromatic. Achromatic, A meaning without, chroma meaning color, achromatic means essentially grayscale, black and white. And this is when you're using only values, tints and shades, but no color, no chroma. You start to add one color in, mono, one, chroma, color, you get monochromatic. And that's your typical value scale that you see here on the left as well, shades and tints of any given color. Complementary is when you start taking a color and its complement, its opposite, on the color wheel. So for example, if you take orange and blue directly across from each other on the color wheel, you get complementary colors. Now these color schemes are actually rooted in science. The wavelengths of the colors um, in these certain blends actually are physically, physiologically pleasing to the receptors in our eyes. And so this creates the effects that we are perceiving. So it's not just a matter of personal preference. These are actually physiologically ingrained in us to be more pleasing than other color blends. Kind of the same way that a major third is physiologically more pleasing to the ear in chordal music than, say, a minor second. So if you were to take orange and blue, that's a complement. But say you wanted, instead of two colors, or one color, or no colors, what if you wanted three colors? Well, you could take that complement and you could split it a little bit. So maybe now you have yellow, and instead of its complement of violet, you'd have red violet and blue violet. This is called a split complementary color scheme. It's a way of introducing three colors. And this is where this color wheel starts to get really useful because it can help you diagram out all of the basic color schemes. If you just take that separation, that split, and split it out a little bit further so that the, each color is equidistant on the color wheel, you get a triadic set. Our primary colors are inherently a triadic set. Secondary colors are also a triadic set. And you can start these points at any point in the wheel, but it will always give you a triadic composition that has a strong balance between the colors. Now triadic, tri being three, could be expanded to four colors. Tetra, four. Tetradic is our next set. And tetradic is where you draw a square or a rectangle on the color wheel. So tetradic here, we could see red orange plus yellow green plus blue green plus red violet gives you a tetradic set. And again, you can rotate this square, this rectangle, so that it fits anywhere on the color wheel and get a useful color scheme of four colors. And lastly, analogous. Analogous means any three to five colors in a row on the color wheel. So again, you could start anywhere. If you start at yellow, you could have yellow, yellow, green, green. That would be three. Or if you go all five, yellow, yellow, green, green, blue, green, blue. Similarly, you could start at blue, green and go blue, green, blue, red, uh, blue, violet, violet, uh, get confused here. Blue, green, blue, blue, violet, violet, um, violet, red, violet, and have five in that way, any three to five in a row. These are your typical color schemes. Just to help put this in concrete terms, let's look at a few examples. Here's an achromatic photo, your typical black and white photo. No color, but all value. Add one color and you get Picasso's blue period, monochromatic. This is all blue using tints and shades of that blue. Complementary, without if you don't consider the outlier of the red the green stem, you have blue and orange, and this is a complementary color scheme where they're opposites on the color wheel. 
complementary colors tend to vibrate. The two colors being opposed to each other on the spectrum uh, create a certain vibration visually um, that can help make things pop out, but they can also make things a little jarring to look at, so you have to use it wisely. Now I will say, here is a perfect example of where real life doesn't follow these rules all the time. Peppers have stems. So especially when you're dealing with photography, it's always really difficult to get a pure color composition. Um, you'll usually end up with slight outliers, which is fine. As long as it ends up being predominantly one color scheme or another, it can usually still be just as pleasing to the eye. Uh, but the more you can sort of mitigate against those outliers taking over your composition and changing it into something else, the better. Moving on to three colors, <clears throat> here we have a split complementary. You can see blue, red-orange, and yellow-orange all being represented here. And here's our famous triadic primary set. Red, blue, yellow. One of the most basic triadic sets you could possibly have, and it's used ad nauseum. Um, it's always good to be as creative with these sets as possible, but sometimes the good old conventional primary colors will do the trick. Here's a tetradic set. You have, uh, and here the, it's a little misleading because the color wheel in this image is flipped upside down from the one that I just used, but you have blue, red, orange, and green. And here we have an example of an analogous set. Vincent van Gogh's painting here uses yellows, yellow-greens, greens, blue-greens, greens, blues. All one after the other on the color wheel. So there you have it. Just about anything you need to know about color. So we'll move on. Texture is our next element of design. And texture is what you think it is. It is the effect of creating something that has a physical feel to it. Now texture can be implied or it can be uh, real. It can be physical or it can be um, an illusion. Visual texture, implied texture, is when you create the effect that something has a feeling. And of course physical texture is when it actually does have a feeling if you were to touch it. So if you start painting on velvet, that velvet is going to have a physical texture. But if you take a piece of paper and you paint something to look like it feels like velvet, that will have an implied or uh, illusory texture. Texture can be a good way to create pattern, as we'll see in a little while. And moving on, space. Space is another element of design. Space can be wide open space where objects are very spaced out and you have a lot of breathing room, or it can be very cluttered space where things are in close proximity to each other. Neither is better than the other, but both are situationally important. Which also leads us to another trick for creating depth. Space can be positive or negative, and you can play with whether the object in question, um, which is considered positive space, positive space refers to the space that describes the object, and negative space is the space that describes what's around the object, the not object, and you can play around with what colors are used to define the positive and negative space. Here you have in the first one, um, one of those optical illusions that can flip back and forth, where if you're looking at it one way, Perhaps the white is the positive space and it's a, a chalice or a vase. Uh, or perhaps the black is the positive space and it's two faces looking at each other on a white background. You can draw things or describe things entirely with negative space. The black is actually the ink that was used to create this drawing. However, the object is what's not drawn, the white that describes this plant. And using spacing and using overlap, you can create a sense of depth. When you have two objects that are closer together, they tend to be closely related in depth. And when you have objects that are farther apart, especially vertically spaced as you approach perhaps a suggestion of a horizon line, you have more depth between the objects. As you can see, the balls on the right look 
uh, there, like there is a more separation in depth between them than the balls on the left, when nothing has actually changed except for their spacing. Similarly, overlap. I think it comes naturally to know that the ball on the right, the yellow ball, excuse me, in the image on the left, the ball on the right, is in front of the ball on the left. On the right-hand image, the blue ball is in front of the yellow ball. This gives us our next trick for creating depth, spacing and overlap. Remember, these are important tricks because when you're creating a flat image, there is no real depth. So in order to have something that is visually striking, you need to know these tricks in order to create the illusion of depth, or else you're just going to get a, a really plain, boring, flat-looking image. Moving on. Now we come to principles of design. So we've got all the basic building blocks, the elements, line, shape, form, color, texture, and space. And now if we start mixing and matching them and start fleshing them out and using them to good effect, we can actually get principles of design, effects that you can create. The first effect you can create is a focal point, sometimes referred to in other people's lists as emphasis. And a focal point is simply where your eye is attracted to first. When you look at an image, all strong compositions have a clearly defined focal point, the place that grabs your attention first. In this case, the red apple. And you can use line, shape, form, color, texture, space to help distinguish what that focal point is, to help draw your eye to that point and make it stand out. Now once you have a focal point, the eye needs to take in the rest of the image. And so you start to get eye movement, which is our next principle of design. And eye movement simply means the way your eye travels around the page in order to take it in. So here, if we were to identify the focal point, it would probably be the wave in this, um, this famous print by Hokusai of uh, various views of Mount Fiji. This wave is the focal point because it is the largest and most prominent thing. Uh, it clearly catches our eye first, but then we still do take in the rest of the, uh, the image. Our eye tends to move perhaps down towards the boat uh, and then diagonally around through that next wave and up to the right side, and we might notice the other boat and the mountain in the background, and then our eye kind of leaps over from the sky to the froth on that top large wave again. And we kind of move in a circle, and you get circular eye movement. Not all images have this circular eye movement, as we'll discover a little bit later, but all images have strong and clearly defined eye movement. When your eye starts getting scattered all over and moving in haphazard directions, very often that's a sign of a poorly composed image. The next principle is rhythm, sometimes referred to as pattern. You can use lines, you can use shapes, you can use textures, forms, colors, space, all of this to create pattern. And pattern is actually a really good tool for helping to create eye movement. These things all work together and they're all interrelated. And then of course, related to our discussion of space is the discussion of scale. When things are closer to you, they get bigger. And when things are farther away, they get smaller. This can be very useful because, especially in photography, um, sometimes the way you give importance to things is by making them larger. And when you have an image like this, where you know it wasn't, ne well, I suppose you don't necessarily know it wasn't Photoshop, but you're less inclined to believe that it was an entire fabrication of the artist's mind, you start to really see that there is some importance to this tricycle. Um, otherwise, it would not be framed in such a way that gives it such scale, such proportion. Proportion is a function of distance. This gives us another trick for creating depth, because we can use scale and proportion through what is called one-point perspective. You could have two-point or three-point perspective as well. Um, to give a sense of how close or far an object is from the viewer. Perspective basically means that 
The further something is, the smaller it gets as it recedes into the distance. Now, the trick to this is that all scenes have a horizon line, which is where the sky meets the ground, and on that horizon line is a vanishing point. One point perspective uses one vanishing point, that's why it's called one point. And here in this image you can see the vanishing point is somewhere near that red truck off in the distance where the road disappears and the trees kind of coincide with the road. And if you were to draw lines radiating out from that vanishing point, you can actually map out exactly how big something should be as it gets closer to you. So these trees are all roughly the same height, physically speaking, but visually speaking, they all recede in size, they get smaller according to those vanishing lines, according to those perspective lines. This gives us our last trick for creating depth, linear perspective, using scale according to those vanishing lines for perspective. Now, three-point perspective and two-point perspective are the same exact principle, but perhaps you're seeing the corner of an object, so one side of it disappears towards one vanishing point off on the left of the image, and the other side of it disappears off to the right side towards the second vanishing point, so you would have two points. Maybe if you're also looking at a severe angle, you're also looking up at a tall skyscraper, it might seem to recede smaller into the sky the farther it gets, so you might have one point to the left, one point to the right, one point up in the sky, and you get three-point perspective. These are all variations off of the same principle. Speaking of principles, balance. Now balance has to do with both visual weight and color balance. We can think of physical balance in terms of does this look too heavy on one side or another? And we can talk about color balance. Does this look too colorful in one direction or another on one side or another? Here. We have two objects of the same size, of the same color, but you notice if you were to hang a string from the very center of the image, as if you were trying to hang it on your wall, or if you were to place it on a scale where the fulcrum is in the very center of the bottom of the image, it might feel like the image wants to tip ever so slightly to the left. And this is because more saturated, darker images tend to carry more visual weight. They feel heavier to us. So even though there's the same amount of space around them, the same placement, it feels like this left side of the image is a little bit heavier than the lighter right side. Scale has the same effect. Larger images look heavier. It's all based on in intuitive physical experience. If you pick something up that's larger than something else, you expect it to be heavier. Whether or not that's always the case, Maybe not, but what's, it's what we experience more often than not, and so visually we tend to expect that something larger is heavier, and it can actually make the image feel like it's falling off to the left or falling off to the right. Proximity can also create visual weight. The balls on the left are closer together, and so they create more of what's called visual tension. And tension is the uh, proximity of an object to another object or to the border of the, the frame. The more tension is created, the more visual weight there is. So because these balls are closer together, they create more tension, which creates more weight and makes this image seem unbalanced towards the left. Now, color balance comes into play too, because you could have an entirely physically balanced image, but end up throwing it entirely out of whack by having a weird distribution of colors that's unbalanced. This painting by Van Gogh is a good example of some of the tricks you can use to balance an image using color. You can see that there's a predominantly yellow area on the left, but yet it somehow doesn't feel unbalanced. And that's because if you start to realize, if you start to look closely, you realize that the color is actually snuck in all over the image. If you look on the right, there's yellow coming through the other opening, the doorway opening. You can see yellow actually in the cobblestones of the pavement. You can see yellow in the windows off in the distance, yellow in the stars in the sky, even little stripes of yellow, yellow-green in the tree off to the right. And so while you have objects that are um, 
uh, physically placed in such a way to create um, visual weight, create balance, you also have them colored in certain ways to help complement that balance. Similarly, you have all of the blue on the right, but it's able to remain balanced because you have the blue on the left, which is so close to the edge that it creates tension. So the weight of that blue, even though it's less blue, becomes enough to balance the expansive blue on the right. And so you can see a pairing of, of uh, visual weight and color balance to try and create an image that doesn't feel like it's going to fall over one side or the other. If you get all of these things working together, you can start to create good compositions. So focal point, eye movement, rhythm, scale, and balance, when working together, can create different types of compositions. Composition refers to the overall structure, the overall schema of how an image is laid out. And we're going to look at a few types, symmetrical, asymmetrical, radial, and all over. We'll go back to our Last Supper image here. This is a perfect example of a symmetrical composition. And what I mean by that is all symmetrical compositions are roughly, though not exactly, sometimes exactly, but usually not exactly, roughly the same on the left half as on the right half, as if you could draw a line down the center and fold it in half and the two halves would more or less line up. All symmetrical images have a central focal point. In this case, the Jesus figure in the center. That is where your eye goes first because of the, the spacing, because of the coloring, because of the scale. Um, all of those tricks draw your eye to a central point. And then all symmetrical compositions have what's called out and back eye movement, where your eye starts at that focal point and then it moves out to one side and then back towards the middle. And then maybe it goes out to the other side and back to the middle and then out and back and out and back and out and back until it sort of uh, pops back and forth side to side, picking up all of those details as it moves around the image, um, taking in the whole image, but always returning to that home base of the central focal point. Now this is in contrast with this next image, Hokusai's The Wave, which we uh, looked at earlier, is a perfect example of asymmetrical composition. If you were to ask yourself where the focal point is, it certainly would not be in the center of the image. If you folded this in half, it wouldn't line up left to right. Because the focal point is off-center, you now have a different kind of eye movement. We described it before as circular. You start off-center to the left, and then you move circularly either around clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on which way your, your attention is drawn first. All asymmetrical compositions, not symmetrical, asymmetrical, have an off-center focal point and circular eye movement, where you move around in a clockwise or, or counterclockwise pattern before returning to that focal point. You can have very sparse asymmetrical compositions, the same way you could have very sparse symmetrical compositions. And here, even though there is really only one pronounced object, this tree, perhaps a few clouds, they manage to balance it and create eye movement. The focal point is, of course, the tree, which is off-center, so that tips you off right away that it is a, an asymmetrical composition. And then your eye moves perhaps through the plane to the left, and then up to those little clouds, and then maybe diagonally arcing back over to the right to that focal point. And so you start to create a clockwise circular eye movement. The reason this doesn't fall off one side or the other, even though all of the objects tend to be on the right, is because the, the photographer here realized that scale creates weight, but so does color. And so the object that has weight on the right side is being balanced by the darkness of the color on the left side. The value is so dark that the blackness of that field on the left is actually enough to weigh down and balance the size of the object on the right. And so if you were to hang a string on this, it would feel like it was resting uh, more or less balanced, more or less um, comfortably without tipping one direction or the other. Now here's an example of where you have a central focal point, 
So your initial guess would be, well, central focal point, it must be a symmetrical composition. But if you start to watch what your eye movement does, not only is it moving out and back, but it also is moving circularly. It goes out and back and around, and out and back and around, and around and out and back and around and around and out and back and out and back. And you start to realize that if you folded this in half, you could actually fold it in half along any axis and it would still match up. And this is what we call radial composition or radially symmetric composition. This is our third type of composition. So we've had symmetric, asymmetric, and now radial. And radial is, is essentially just that. It radiates out from the center in a symmetrical way. And of course, you may realize that this doesn't have much of a focal point at all, or perhaps it has a bunch of focal points. It might be the yellow, it might be the red, it might be the blue, it might be the lines. Your eye kind of darts around. It doesn't have a coherent eye movement. It doesn't have any sort of real organizational schema that you can easily identify. And it turns out this is because this is an all-over composition. All-over compositions are usually hard to find unless you're looking at one of those I spy books or abstract art. And that's usually because they're only used for a specific purpose. And here, in this case, Pierre Mondrian was using an all-over composition to try and thwart all of the principles and elements of design. He wanted to create something that had no organizational schema, that had no priority. And these were for, tied into his... Uh, his larger overarching worldviews and trying to figure out how to express those through his art, but he wanted to de-establish the priority of a focal point um, and destroy the sense of an organizational schema. So he was actually purposely trying to thwart all those things that we just created. But here you have a great example of an all-over composition. So now we have the elements and the principles of design. What we're going to look at next is how you can apply these or variations of these to create a good image. There are a few more tricks here, um, including framing. You can have all of the best elements and the best principles all used very well, but if you have framed your image wrong, you're going to still end up subverting everything that you just tried to do. Framing is about creating strong compositions with your camera about deciding what's in and what's out. One trick that's really useful for framing is the rule of thirds. If you were to divide your image into thirds so that there were three lines or three chunks going across and three chunks going uh, vertically, the intersections and the lines themselves are really great places for objects to land. Things tend to look more comfortable to the eye and more balanced if objects coincide with those lines or with those nodes. The other thing to keep in mind is the screen size that people will be viewing the image on. You might have a great image, but if you framed it as a sort of wide shot, as a far away shot, and people are going to be viewing it on a small screen, say their phone, you might end up with a really ineffective image. It's just going to seem like a bunch of people standing around and you lose the emotion of the speaker's face or you lose the drama of the situation because people can't get close enough to it to really appreciate it simply because of the screen size. If this were on a desktop, it might work really well. So if you're using, if you know your readers are going to be looking primarily on phones or small screen size, you might want to do more close-ups, more uh, drawn in shots where you can get, capture more detail, maybe less uh, distracting backgrounds. You also want to consider unusual angles. Most people don't want to see something that they feel like they could have seen themselves. The reason you want to be in the mix as a photographer is to give someone a perspective that they couldn't have gotten themselves. So by getting an unusual angle, an unusual take on a scenario that maybe might be fairly trite otherwise, um, can be a really good way to create an interesting composition by framing it from an unusual angle. You have to be careful though because sometimes this can get gimmicky. The drop down to a knee and shoot upwards approach can only be taken so far and sometimes it looks like oh he's just trying to take a boring image and make it really interesting by getting lower and shooting up. 
So you have to use this sort of with a discerning eye for when is it actually enhancing your image and when is it, when is it just looking gimmicky. And of course, avoid cliches. This is especially uh, useful when you're trying to set up objects for uh, a staged image or when you're trying to take images of people for momentous occasions. You never want to get the handshake moment. Every coronation, every diploma, every celebration always has a handshake image. Instead, get the moment before the handshake where the two world powers make eye contact. Get the moment after the handshake where they start to uh, interact with the audience. Get the moments that are less expected so that the viewer doesn't feel like they already know what's going on before they've really taken in your image. By the way, a good, a good rule of thumb for avoiding cliches is try and think of the first image you imagine when you think of your subject matter and then don't take that image. Go to the second image that comes to mind or the third or try and tweak it until you have something that's a little less obvious. The next thing for framing is juxtaposition. Because it's harder to compose imaginatively with photography the way you would a painting, a painting you can create anything. You want a unicorn? Paint a unicorn. However, with photographs, you're working with what's actually there, what's in front of you. So juxtaposition becomes the key mode of creating drama and tension in a photograph. By taking two objects that seem like they either should be related or shouldn't be related and juxtaposing them in a really striking way, you can create an interesting composition that has a lot more than just a uh, cliché or run-of-the-mill idea, idea. Here with the juxtaposition of this tank and this tricycle all being uh, given almost the same visual priority because of the scale, you start to see the a real striking example of the the impact of war on childhood, or, or perhaps the training of youth through games to create war and all of that, it becomes a much more compelling image because of the juxtaposition here in this framing. Now that brings us to cropping, and this is the last section we'll look at for these elements and principles of design. Cropping is what to leave out. Sometimes you may frame an image really well, but then realize that there's just extra stuff you don't need. For example, the image on the left, fairly compositionally balanced. Um, it's not necessarily a weak image. However, you don't need all of that stuff on the right. No one needs to see the yellow balloon. No one needs to see the advertising on the storefront behind her. And so it might actually do, uh, do you don't need to see the elbow of the person on the left. You, you might actually do your picture more justice to take what was perhaps an asymmetrical composition and crop it in to create a symmetrical composition as we have on the right. Get rid of unnecessary info. Another thing to keep in mind is the aspect ratio of where you're putting this image. Cropping can solve a lot of problems. For example, you can accentuate the verticality of an image by cropping it in a vertically narrow way. Or if you have a Facebook image, Facebook banner, you'll want to crop it in a horizontal la landscape way so that it actually plays to the uh, platform you're putting it on. And of course, as you're cropping, you'll want to remember framing. You don't want to take a vertical image and try and use it as your Facebook banner. Um, these trees would end up getting cropped and you wouldn't get a sense of the grandeur and majesty. However, a landscape where it's primarily horizontal lines Again, elements of style, uh, uh, the horizontal lines creating a, a sense of horizon, a sense of stability, work really well for long horizontal images. And another trick of the trade is not to crop joints. Our eyes tend to think that joints that are cropped, elbows, knees, ankles, look really uncomfortable. It starts to make them look awkwardly positioned, or like they're about to fall over, or like they got stuck in the mud. But if you crop in between joints, at thighs, at forearms, at uh, um, shins, then you start to get a more natural feel where we start focusing less on the joint and wondering, well, I wonder what the bottom half of that leg is doing. And we start to be able to focus more on the subject in question. So here you have it, the elements and principles of design with a few guides for framing and cropping. Elements, line, shape, form, color, texture, space, 
being used to create principles of focal point, eye movement, rhythm, scale, and balance, all tempered with these guides of using the rule of thirds and considering screen size, unusual angles, cliches, and juxtaposition in framing your shot, and then cropping out unnecessary info to an, appro an appropriate aspect ratio, keeping in mind of what you're cropping where. All of this can go hand in hand with each other to create strong compositions. In the next video segment, we're going to look at page layout and how some of these can be applied to create strong compositions on a page.